thank you all for coming tonight. And tonight what we're wrestling with is a big question. The theme, uh, why the Bible is not the word of God, begs the question, who's God, which God, what is God, and who cares anyway? And perhaps in our discussion we will get into those particular questions. But as a starting point, um, again, wanted to point out that I'm grateful to Andrew and Valerie for being with us. All three of us come out of the same branch of Christianity. Um, and they are joining with me tonight to focus on this deeply spiritual question about authority. Who or what authors your life? That's what tonight is really about. That's what the question's really about. Each of us come from a narrow Christian tradition that has as its primary authority the Bible. Um, the Bible is a specific set of writings, and it held authority over our emotions and our actions. In other words, rather than our own intellect and our own experiences, rather than even trusting our own self, we each come from a story that told us to conform our experience and our intellect to certain revealed truths. And these truths were written in the Bible and of course interpreted by clergy. And each of us are alienated from that tradition. Each of us have taken a path out of that tradition. Each of us have found that such a way of life and that such a story didn't work for us. And it didn't answer our questions, it didn't help us mature, it didn't help us evolve. And so this forum, Why the Bible is Not the Word of God, is actually about authority. Who or what authors your life? Who or what helps guide you in your behaviors, your thoughts, your emotions, your attitudes, and your daily moments? And for some, authority is located in an ideology. For others, it's in a patriotism of some sort, or a loyalty that is given to a person, or an idea, or a tribe, or a tradition. Others locate authorities within themselves, but that simply begs the question, well, who are you? And what has shaped you into being who you are? None of us can get away from the question of what story has shaped us, what authority um, is there in our life that guides our emotions and our intellect. Now, historically, there has always been from the beginning a tension within Christianity. It's a tension about power and control. For some, Christianity is an inherited tradition. They don't really think much about it. Uh, it's a family and tribal tradition. They've been raised in it and therefore it's true. For others, it's a mystical experience. And, it, and, and that mystical experience is made sense of through this big overall Christian story. And from the very beginning, there was a tension between those who were mystically and spiritually innovative and those who were rooted in the rituals that gave comfort and hope. But the tension leads to problems once you gather in community. For example, what happens even inside a family or a network or a team or, or any communal endeavor when disagreement inevitably pops up? Some disagreements are minor. And a group, particularly a small group, can process it all through consensus and dialogue. But as the group grows and the issues deepen, the glue that holds the group together calls out for a broker or an arbitrator um, who can adjudicate between factions. And traditionally, as you all know, in the family, this was who? The, the papa. Papa, traditionally. Uh, it was the Papa. The Papa was the presence of authority, of power, and control. And tribally, the Papa became the chief, the king. Uh, the great secular experiment of America was to locate authority inside the law, in the Constitution. And that was a check and balance by the majority of those that the law and Constitution ruled. Today, and this is, I'm trying to make a connection here today, one of the problems that we're having in our society is that we're living in a time of shattered and shredded authority. The glue that held us together is coming undone. Now, as the church grew up, it also split into factions. The Orthodox branch located authority, God, if you will, inside the liturgy itself. And to this day, if you go and you worship inside an Orthodox church, you'll participate in almost the identical rituals that they participated in 1800, 1900 years ago. The Rome, because that's where God is. God is in the liturgy. You will experience God there. Heaven opens up and comes to earth there. The Roman Catholic Church, 
as you know, seized the rule of interpretation, both of scripture and the faith, and they placed it into the hands of the Papa, the Pope, who then commissioned his priests, we call them Father, to be his representatives. And the presence of God became located in the Eucharistic sharing of bread and cup, which became a spiritual communion of consuming the literal body and blood of Christ, magically transferring his spirit into the believer. And all of this was under the authority of the Papa. Now the Protestant Reformation, which we all come from, the word Protestant means to protest, rebelled against these constraints. And they basically said every believer is his own Pope, his own Papa. And they have direct access to the presence of God. So truth, authority was inside the believer. But there was a problem. If everybody has access, how do you settle disagreements? The Protestant principle located the God's presence in the scriptural text itself. The Bible itself became the location of God. But you can already see the problem. Mark Driscoll of Mars, Dr Mars Hill reads the same Bible that I do, but with extremely different interpretations. As a matter of fact, I would say that we worship different gods. Um, even though we both develop our image of God out of the very same text. So it's kind of a mess, this authority question. It's not an easy one to unravel. But here, uh, and here is where everyone, Christian or not, religious or not, can fit into this conversation tonight. You all have the same identical problem. We as a nation have the same identical problem. Who are we as a people? What are the values that glue us together despite our differences? What authority, what authorities are we willing to submit to for the good of all? Essentially, what story are we telling ourselves that helps us all get along? And that to me is at the root of this question about the Bible being the word of God. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Valerie who will then turn it over to Andrew and they're just gonna offer some reflections. Um, these are unscripted. They know what I'm gonna say. I don't know what they're saying. And they don't know what they're gonna say. I can see, I mean, can you show them your you notes, Andrew? Notes. <laughs> There's Andrew's notes. <laughs> 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 and then, uh, um, and then we'll, we'll break up into a group and then we'll come back. <laughs> you can have my notes. <laughs> Do you want me to talk here? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can, can you all hear me? All right. Um, this fall during the election cycle, we had a number of, of Republican candidates who had what I would describe as rape Tourette's, um, meaning they just couldn't help blurting horrible things about rape. And, and you know, that included our own candidate, John Coster, who mercifully um, lost the election probably because of that. Um, but one of the, you know, and one of the, the, the people who had that condition that I describe as rape Tourette's um, said, you know, basically, even if, even if, you know, rape is this horrible thing. If there's a pregnancy that comes out of it and a baby's born, that's something that God intended. It was Murdoch, I think, who, who said that. And, and I thought, you know, the reason they keep blurting horrible things about rape and the reason they get stuck in these awful media circuses is because they're, they're, they're trapped. By their, by their beliefs. There are certain kinds of fundamentalist beliefs that actually bind people. And so I decided to write an article about that. I write for a place called Alternet and the Huffington Post and some other places online. And um, so I, I set out to write an article that I titled What the Bible Says About Rape and Rape Babies. And I basically wanted to make the point that when people have this view that there is an interventionist God who, you know, kind of, who is um, messing around with our affairs um, and who says, you know, like in the book of Isaiah, I created good and evil, that they end up stuck with these beliefs that if you kind of trap them in an interview, get uncovered, and then they look really awful because they actually are really awful. And um, as I was wrestling with that article, I realized something about the Bible that I'd never noticed before, which is that there is no place in the Bible that it says or implies 
that a woman's consent is needed or desired prior to sexual intercourse. Not the Old Testament, not the New Testament. There are other ways that female and male relationships change over the course of time in which the Bible was written and the, those texts were assembled. That is not one of them. Um, and in fact, if you look at the Bible, there are many ways and many kinds of relationships and reproductive strategies, if you will, that suggest that non-consensual sex is both sanctified, um, endorsed by the code of behavior that is kind of in place at the time, and that God then blesses non-consensual sex with um, boy babies who go on to kind of be, um, you know, patriarchs and such. Um, so, you know, an early example of that might be Rachel and Leah fighting over who's going to bear the most offspring. And then when they're having fertility problems and the mandrakes aren't work, roots aren't working too well, sending in their servants. Um, Sarah also, as you know, sends in Hagar. It never suggests that Hagar has a say in that. Right, um, and then of and then you know another example early on might be just the whole notion that fathers give their daughters in marriage. Um, one of the things that happens in the Old Testament, if you actually look closely at the Old Testament ethic governing male-female relationships, it's actually not a rights ethic. Like there are there are there is an ethic in the Old Testament law that governs inter relationships between men, and that tends to be. Um, an ethic that is a that is the kind of ethic that we think of today governing relationships between equals. But the relationship governing females is, is a property ethic, actually. So a female is property. Her role is to produce offspring of known origin. If she gets raped, the rapist can essentially buy her by paying her father 50 shekels, and then he is obligated to keep her. Um, if a woman, on the other hand, ruins her economic value by voluntarily losing her virginity and becoming then of kind of questionable emotional status and questionable pregnancy status, she can be killed for it. So, there, so there's this standard, and 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 this, and again, that is a standard that it puts women into the same category that slaves are in, that livestock are in, and that children are in throughout um, most of the, the, the biblical texts. Uh, so I, I say that as an example of why the Bible can't be the word of God. And part of what happens when people engage in a process that I call bibliolatry, which means making an idol out of the biblical text itself putting it on a pedestal, treating it as if it were not the struggling of our ancestors to understand what is good and what is real and how to live in moral community with each other. But when instead they put it on a, text, uh, on a pedestal and make it, the Bible itself, an idol, then it binds them to these Iron Age understandings of what it means to be male and female, what it means to be human, what it means to be good, and some very, very ugly things come out of that kind of idolatry. Um, Rich mentioned Ma um, Mars Hill Church and Mark Driscoll. I was at Mars Hill a few years back prior to the Easter service, and Mark Driscoll was, who is a biblical literalist and stands, kind of has constructed a, a version of Christianity that stands or falls on that biblical literalism, said, if the resurrection didn't literally happen, there is no reason for us to be here. If the resurrection didn't literally happen, there are parties to be had. There are women to be had. There are guns to shoot. There are people to shoot. And at the time, feeling a little snarky about the whole thing, I thought to myself, well, you know, if the only thing standing between you and debauchery, lechery, and violence is your belief in the literal resurrection. I'm really, really glad you believe that. <laughs> um, 
I was irritated because, of course, I don't have to tell you in this room what he was implying about the rest of us. Um, but if you look at, think about what he said a little more seriously, part of what, what it, it conveys or what it reveals, perhaps inadvertently, is this sense that, that if you embrace this biblical literalism, this bibliolatry, this sense of the Bible itself as the word of God, then you don't have to come up with any deeper, harder, more um, fibrous, tougher, complex, and, and, and robust answer to the question of why we shouldn't be drunk and raping and killing each other. There are very good reasons. There are very good answers to those questions. But in the context of biblical literalism, you never get there. How much time do I have left? <laughs> OK. Um, I, when I was working on my book, Trusting Doubt, one of the things that I realized in thinking and wrestling with this question of biblical literalism is that, you know, Bibliolatry, I said, is the, is the worship of a book. It's actually the worship of a communications technology, the written text. And if you think about human history, there was a time when our best understanding of the world around us, our, our, our metaphoric, mythic, epic stories were handed down by oral tradition. In fact, much of what's in the Bible was originally handed down that way. But when things were handed down by oral tradition, they were free to evolve as, as human society evolved, as it became more complex, as technologies changed, as, as our understanding of ourselves and each other and the world around us deepened. Um, when, we, when we developed the written word, one of the things that happened actually is that allowed us in a sense to become developmentally arrested because the written word is static. And so it, it allows there to become a disconnect between people's understanding of what is true and what is sacred and, and the ongoing change in society and our interdependence and complexity, which grows as technology changes and as people become more densely populated and so forth. And, and then when you have the canonization of texts, right, a set of texts, you not only have a given text that's static, you have a set of texts now that is static. So it says not only do we, is, is, is uh, you know, this fragment unalterable, but now we've got the Bible or, or this collection that can't be added to or deleted from. And, 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 and then what that does is it really, as I said earlier, binds people to a specific set of, iron, of in this case, um, Iron Age understandings of the world around us and goodness and, and, and God, if, if, if that is kind of how you describe the ultimate reality and the ultimate goodness. Um, I get excited about the internet um, in part because I think one of the things that it does is it puts the conversation back in motion so that you have in the best of the written word, right, which is what the written word lets you do is it lets you take ideas, assemble them slowly, think about them in a deep way, and then transmit them to people who have no physical contact with each other and who don't have the capacity to retain an oral tradition, which I certainly don't have. Um, and at the same time, it's fluid, it's always changing, and there's a whole generation of people who recognize, like, if, you know, who recognize that. Like, you go to Wikipedia, and the article may not be the same from one day to, to, to the next. In fact, a static body of text is, is considered a weakness, right? They say a book is out of date the minute that it's in print, and we have now developed a communications technology that transcends that. So, I. I think that that both, to me, again, is a reminder of why the Bible can't be the word of God. It's so finite, so it's so finite that it's obsolete <laughs> um, from a technology standpoint. And, um, and it also gives me hope that we are able to really put the conversation, the big conversation, back in motion. All right, so, um, so I'm going to be a little bit contrary, and also I, um, I, 
I might find myself unexpectedly or in ways that I hadn't, hadn't quite imagined agreeing thoroughly with, um, with um, Valerie's point of view while offering a contrast to it. So I also, I grew up in a family in which the Word of God, the Bible, that is literally the King James Version of the Bible, um, a precise, uh, a precise de designation of a specific translation of the Bible that was made in about, what, 1602 or something like that? 1611. And um, all of the rhythms, uh, all of the rhythms of, of my speech, all of the rhythms of my childhood were couched in the language of the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, to the extent that, se that 20 some years ago when I first came to Seattle and I went to the University of Washington for a couple of years, I took the first ever Shakespeare class I had ever taken. And on the first day of class, we were assigned to read one of Shakespeare's plays and I took it home and I didn't understand anything that I was reading. The language was, it, it seemed like a foreign language to me. And, and then on the second day of class, the professor just happened to mention that Shakespeare wrote most of his plays around the same time that the King James Version of the Bible was translated, and I went home and I could read every single word of every Shakespeare play, and I knew what the language was. It was, it was as though there was this shift at a cellular level for me that just transformed my ability to understand Shakespeare. So I grew up in a world in which not only the language was precise, but it was dependab dependably accurate in the, most scientific, um, in the most scientific way. Every single word of the Bible was directly dictated specifically by God in order to communicate directly and completely with the human beings who are on, who are on this planet. So I also grew up in a world in which the Bible was viewed as essentially as a scientific text. That is when, when, uh, um, when who's the guy who stood on the hill and God stopped the, the earth from moving for about a, oh, Joshua. Joshua, Joshua stood on the hill and, and uh, in the middle of the battle, God wanted to give more time for the Israelites to beat their opponents. And so God said, all right, hold up your, your hand with, I can't remember the story now. I've read it about a billion times, but what was it? <laughs> he stops the sun, he stops he the sun in its motion. That was literally true. It was a scientific observation, and it, and it was recorded in the Bible, and we were expected to accept and believe every single word of it. And, and you did that so they could slaughter the enemy. Exactly, so that they could slaughter the enemy. So here's what's interesting. We all, actually, all of us grew up in a world in which the word belief has been given within the past couple of hundred years, really, only in relatively modern times, a very specific meaning that it never had before. The word belief today essentially means agreement or congruence with a certain stated set of factual declarations. It mean, if I believe something, it means uh, somebody out there says, here's some stuff, here's some objective observations, or here's a set of, of, conclusive, uh, of, of, of conclusions you can draw about the state of the universe or the nature of reality or about what human beings are or who we are or what we do. And if you agree with these beliefs, then you are orthodox. And if you agree with those other beliefs, then you are not orthodox or you believe in some other system of thought. But there's, we're still talking about beliefs here. But in the Bible, the translation of the Bible, as a matter of fact, the word belief came from, from a, a root of the Greek word pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S, -I and it did not mean intellectual or agreement with a set of intellectual assertions. It instead meant faith. And by faith, what it meant was essentially, what is it that fundamentally deeply motivates your life? What is it that absolutely is at the center of who you are? What is it that drives your behavior and your, rela your relationships? What is it that moves your passions in the deepest possible way? It's interesting to me also that the first recorded instance in the history of the world when the word atheist was used, it was in, a, in, in the second century AD. It was used in the context of the Roman Empire 
and it was used only and explicitly to define and describe Christians. The reason is that for the first time, somebody in the Roman Empire was willing to say, I literally, I do not believe that Caesar is the son of God, the savior of the world. The gospel is the good news of Roman law spread through the provinces. That Caesar himself will be, will be resurrected and will live again. He is the son of God, very literally. All of the language that we know of today as being the language of Christianity was originally the language of the Roman Empire in describing Caesar. And the ironic, the, the ironic uh, substitution of Jesus for Caesar was a crime against the state. Atheists were people who said, your version of God, I think, is bullshit. There's a different way to understand what God is. And people died for that belief. In some sense, um, I'm not at all sure that Valerie, for example, in calling herself an atheist would agree with me, but my guess is that Valerie's brand of atheism is far, far closer to the original definition of an atheist as someone who has a completely different understanding of what divinity or spirituality is all about than the, than the prevailing culture was willing to admit. And far closer to what Jesus proclaimed as the word of God than many, many generations of so-called Christians since then. So my answer to the question, what is the word of God, or is the Bible the word, the word of God, my answer is actually, Yes and no. Yes and no. Yes in the sense that there is something unnameable, something mysterious, something beyond human comprehension, something way outside our ability to grasp and describe and analyze. And it's something that, that for want of a better word, we call, many of us call, God. When I think about God, I don't think actually about, you know, the, the notion that I had with, of God when I was growing up is this old white guy sitting in the sky on a golden throne in the middle of a, a, of a city with 12 gates, with golden streets and pearly, pearly walls, um, sitting on a throne from which, under which, th uh, from under which flowed the, the river of life. And God, with his great big white beard and his big white robe and his gleaming eyeballs, um, essentially told all the rest of us, you're going to hell, you're going to heaven, you're going to hell, you're going to heaven. I think that's baloney. Complete and utter baloney. It's a projection of our need to have a father tell us what to do and who we are. But I do believe that there is something that I could call God that is all about the realization of the human imagination, the set of relationships, a multitude of relationships that we have each with the other and with every other single living creature in the universe. And that relationship I would call God or I would call love or I would call delight or I would call possibility. I don't, you know, I could use all kinds of different words in the, in the sense that I understand God by the fundamentalist w that I grew up among, I might be termed a uh, an atheist, but I think it's something much bigger and much deeper than that, actually. So when I think about the Word of God, I think, well, yes, actually, the Bible was the Word of God, and so is that folding chair right there. So is that light bulb up there. So are you. So am I. So is the river that flows the Duwamish that flows into Elliott Bay with all of the pustulence and all of the pollution that it carries with it. In, in fact, I would say that every emanation of the physical world and every way in which that physical world is related to an unphysical world or an in, unseen, invisible world, all of this, all of us are in fact the Word of God. And when we notice what is the word of God? Truly, when we have this, 
gargantuan universal understanding of the word of God, we're somewhat closer to noticing what justice is all about and where love came from and how am I related to you. And all of this is expressed in a phrase that you'll find in the Hebrew Bible and in the New Testament. And it's called the golden rule. It's a common assertion of every significant spiritual tradition on earth that the essence, the essence of what, it, what makes us worth, worth caring about, any of us, is that we know how to, at a cellular, at an, an essentially genetic level, we know that it's important to care for your neighbor as, as yourself, to love your neighbor as yourself. Actually, the, the, whole, the whole thing is love, you know, Jesus in, in his expression of the two fundamental commandments said, there are two commandments that matter. One is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and the other is love your neighbor as yourself. There are actually three commandments embedded in that statement. One is love God, whatever that is. The depth of that, of that statement is something that I can't express. Secondly, love your neighbor. I can get that a little bit more. Then love yourself. That fundamentally, I mean, that for me is the hardest of the three commandments. But it, in some ways, is the foundation of all of them. Because if you don't, under, if you don't have the, capac the capacity to look deep into yourself and to notice the spark of divinity that is within you, you can't recognize the spark of divinity that's in the Duwamish River or in your neighbor whom you meet on the street downtown or in the park next door. So I believe in the word of God. <laughs> I think part of, um, there's a reason that we laugh at people who get too full of themselves. And one of the great things, if you look at young people, is that they're, they're, it, there's a whole generation that in which the culture is very much about being able to laugh at yourself. and. Um, to the point that you have people, you know, pompous people showing up on the John Stewart show because they may or may not actually be able to laugh at themselves, but they understand that that's what the culture demands. And that makes hypocrisy and authority harder. And so I actually do have some hope, not that we are ever going to get rid of authority because I think we are hierarchical beings. I think we yearn for that. I think that's that that when we look at the kinds of social structures that have succeeded that have survived over the years they survive because there are things built into our psyches that crave that on the other hand um, on the other hand there's change afoot that would suggest that the power of authority is diminished at least at this point in history and on a diminishing trajectory but, you know, I'd, I'd like to uh, jump in and, and have either either of you uh, take this on. Uh, but part of the problem of authority is, um, uh, on the one hand, I'm going to use Occupy as an example. Occupy was chaos. And if you went up to Seattle um, Community College, particularly towards the end, it was, I mean, people, <laughs> the impression I got was that the campers themselves were saying, please, somebody come and tell us to break these camps down. And, and that was one of the reasons it was peaceful uh, when they broke it down. I mean, it was, it was hell on, it was, it was Woodstock. Woodstock was great for the first day and when the drugs were flowing. By the last day, the third day, it was, you know, it was hell. Um, and even as, as a pastor, I'm a person in authority. And one of the um, um, places where I feel that is if, if, the, if the pastor in a group, now you can translate this into almost anything, but I'll just translate it into what I know. If the pastor ab abdicates the authority or the position of making sure that the whole gang is getting along, um, what happens is when that person, that facilitator, so to speak, doesn't do the job 
of making tough decisions, the, 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 those who are assembled, the flock, so to speak, will devour themselves because somebody always wants power. And the, 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 the trickiest wickets that I know of as a pastor to get through is when I'm around people, either in the church or outside the church, who claim an egalitarianism but what you really find out when you begin to look at the dynamics is it is the charismatic, it is the persuader, it is someone who has access to power that winds up uh, taking it um, and pretending that they're not taking it. Um, so, uh, uh, Jim, did you want to jump in on that? Well, I want to say something, but I don't want to interrupt your talk. Okay. I didn't know, okay. Andrew, did you? Yeah, I just had, uh, I had a thought about authority. Um, one thing, that, and this was triggered by something that Valerie said, actually. The, it's, I actually don't think that, that the role of authority is diminishing. I think the locus of authority is changing. That is, in the, in the era, in, in the 21st century, in the era of social media and the internet and all of these new, vast new communications technologies that we have available to us, it becomes ever more apparent that the locus of authority is, is increasingly internal to every individual. And the argument would be that, that the only true authority that I have, or that any one of us have, is the story that I can tell from my own life and my own experience. And that's self-evident, actually. Um, I may have all kinds of opinions about you or the world or this politician or or that uh, decision that somebody else made. But the only absolute authority that I can claim is that I can tell you how I view the world. I can tell you about the experience that I had when I was 12 years old when my dad beat the crap out of me and I responded by feeling the, the following way. Or I can tell you um, about, you know, why did my first marriage break up from my point of view? where I can tell you about how I felt when my child was born and I held a baby in my, my arms for the first time who would someday call me dad. I have the authority to say, here's how I feel and where I came from and nobody can deny that to me. Right? In the era of social media, every human being on the planet at, at this point, as a matter of, not everyone yet, but at this point, there are over 1.1 billion people who have accounts on Facebook. <laughs> that may be horrifying, but it's a characteristic of the modern world that all of us have the capacity to, to, to express our own authority in a way that was never possible before in human history. And there's an interesting conclusion that follows from that, that I think is contained in a wonderful recent book written and published by a guy named Harvey Cox, and I can't remember the name of it. I think it's called The Future of Faith. Um, in this book, Harvey Cox posits that there have been three epics in the history of Christianity. The first, the first, within the first few hundred years of Christianity, he calls the Age of Faith. And it was, the, it was the beginnings of Christianity when there was this fresh and very new message that had been received um, through the works and the life and the words of Jesus that was a transformation of any, what anybody had thought about before, about God and religion and their lives and their relationships. And then there was a second age of belief that he posits essentially was this the, the, the principal way in which religion, Christian religion was revealed or ex expressed from probably 350 AD or so, right after Constantine's, Constantine's declaration of the legitimacy of Christianity as the Roman imperial faith, all the way up to, you know, the present day just about, maybe within the last century. And the third epic of Christianity he calls the epic of the future, which he says is the age of the spirit. And it's a return to the original understanding that Jesus expressed of the, the original wisdom of the, uh, of the message that, that Jesus brought um, through his life to, the, to, to, to others. 
and the age of the spirit is expressed in the authority of the individual human being who is able to say, here's who I am, here's my story, here is my pain, here is my love, here is my disaster, here is the, the lesson that I've learned from my life. And it is only the human being, truly, the individual who can say, I love, because the rest of it is an expression. All of the behavior of a human society is contained in some way in the individual actions and, and um, understandings of the people who make it up. The question, why do we have fundamentalists, it seems so obvious that there are flaws in that way of thinking. I'm a psychologist as well as a former fundamentalist, so I will put on both of those hats as I answer this question. The core thing that you have to remember, there's a couple things you have to remember, but one is that our sense of reality is socially constructed. That's true for all of us. It's true for you and I right now, just as well as it is for a fundamentalist. And that, uh, so our community gates the flow of information. It, reality, it kind of reality tests our ideas. It kind of mirrors back to us what works and what doesn't work. And when you are in a, a fundamentalist community, one of the things that happens is that that kind of thinking very effectively gates information flow. Um, so I, I have a YouTube channel in which I actually just did a video about how beliefs resist change and talked about the different layers of defenses um, that a, a belief system erects in order to, uh, to safeguard itself. But the other thing to r remember is that all of us are also prone to what's called confirmatory thinking. Right. So, so, and in, and and in fact, so basically, what that means is it's like we've got filters that, that instinctively allow information, confirmatory evidence, to come through in bright and shining colors, and it dims down and shades out anything that's disconfirmatory. And the whole power of the scientific method is that it erects. Um, resistance to that, it erects barriers, it forces us to construct a way of asking a question that pushes us up against um, the information or the evidence that what, we're, what we think is true might not be true because our instinct is always to, to kind of seek confirmatory evidence and to underestimate the power of disconfirmatory evidence. So in Christianity, or in fundamentalist Christianity, I mean, um, <laughs> confirmatory thinking is actually often uh, idolized, it's honored. There's, um, for example, a book called the Encyclopedia of Biblical Dif Bible Difficulties, I think it's called, by a guy named Gleason Archer, in which he starts out by, by saying, presume that the Bible is the perfect, inerrant word of God, and then you work backwards from there. If you start with that assumption, then you can find a way to justify, rationalize, excuse, you know, or whatever, you know, kind of contort your thinking in such a way as to kind of find a, a way to assemble anything that seems like a, a, a discrepancy. It becomes a difficulty. You grow up in a system of contradictions, and, and sometimes you're even aware of them, but those contradictions are, you are not allowed to call those into question. And so, Valerie, can you, can, I mean, I'm going to put you on the spot, but can you give an example of you growing up right there in Wheaton, where you're wrestling with these dilemmas, like within your own family, but not being allowed to do what Bob did, and that was he, he found contradictions and somehow was allowed to voice them and make those contradictions le legitimate. Uh, in fundamentalism, they can't get that far. You can't legitimize those. Well, I mean, there are even verses in the Bible, like a fool has said in his heart, there is no God, or, um, you know, lean not unto your own understanding, right? So, so basically, you're getting the message from an early age that, that rationality is not to be trusted, and, um, and that if you, if you see that suffering, for example, suffering is one of those things that can create a real sense of contradiction, whether it's your own suffering or the suffering of another person who, that, that seems unfair or unjustified. And, 
and there are uh, layers of, of rationalization. So, you know, I was told that if somebody's suffering, it's because maybe they, they've done something wrong that I didn't know about, or maybe their parents did something wrong, because in that system in which um, children are actually possessions of parents, then you can have the mindset that God punishes children for the sins of their parents. In fact, again, there are verses in the Bible that explicitly say that, and we heard that when the Sandy Hook shootings happened, right? That um, there were people who alleged that God allowed that to happen because the adults didn't allow prayer in schools or Bibles in schools, and, and God took it. I mean, it, it, but so, so it gets to be really convoluted. Well, I, I think something, what's being missed here a bit is that rationalization, ration, rationalization or even reasoning is um, a relatively superficial justification of some very, very deep-seated set deep -seated mechanisms that are far below our consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that, that um, essentially what we think of as our belief systems are shaped by what happens in our lizard brain. Um, and, um, and is beyond our ability to, to sum up or understand. And so we don't change our mind because something begins to be illogical to us. We change our minds because something much deeper happens to us that, that enables us to confront sometimes the, the trauma that has prevented us from being able to do that in our earlier lives or in earlier um, generations of our families. So personally, I did have the questions that you talked about when I was four or five or six years old, and they never were fully answered. And for some reason that I, I can't claim credit for particularly, um, I was the only person in my generation of the family and in any previous generation of my family going back probably a thousand years to question a set of beliefs that, that grew out of the Scots-Irish immigration to America and the Revolutionary War and the Civil War in this country and the First World War and the Second World War and the Vietnam War. All, uh, all of the, the massive trauma that was visited in individual lives and in the collective life of our country and our community. Um, all of the spankings that my great-grandfather got, you know, had something to do with the set of ideas that I ended up with. When, when I began to really kind of start to understand this was when, you know, I was doing early on some research on my book and I discovered that my great-grandfather had been a leading member of the Ku Klux Klan in Texas in 1921, 2022. Um, it was the only year in the history of Texas when both houses of the state legislature plus the governor and one of the U.S. senators of, from Texas was open, member, uh, open members of the Klan, the majority. That was, the, I think, their highest, that five-year period, they had their highest membership that they had. And they're probably their highest uh, national influence. So my question, you know, I, I grew up in a family who never talked about that. They only talked about how wonderful it was. We could be proud of our great grandfather, who was this wonderful civic leader, right? <laughs> so I, I grew up, you know, objecting to that tradition and objecting to thinking of my great grandfather as a deeply evil human being who uh, deserved no understanding or forgiveness. And then I, I started doing research and found out that for the book, and I found out he was born in 1859 at the age of four, at the time when his earliest memories were being shaped, he was driven with his family as a refugee from the state of Missouri where they emigrated to Texas having lost absolutely everything in the world. At the earliest moments of his life, he was witness to, to the most horrific violence, murder, death, bloodshed scenes. Um, his, his brother, his older brother came back from the Civil War, uh, a, a wounded cripple. And the family went from having everything and being wealthy to having absolutely nothing and scrap, scrabbling for turnips and nothing else to eat for dessert or dinner. And so he grew up in a, in a world in which the, it was a deeply terrifying, painful, awful, awful place, full of misery, starvation, degradation, and... Uh, and violence. 
and he grew up to be, perhaps unsurprisingly, a Baptist preacher and a Ku Klux Klanner. <laughs> now, how do you just, how do you rec, how do you, you know, put, put those pieces together? I don't think you can unless you notice the impact of trauma on a, in the formative years of a little boy. The question is about the non-theistic faiths like Buddhism that, that talk about uh, the, again, the internal, the authority is the internal locus and there is no outside authority, okay? Um, either. Well, I think that, you know, the, that is one reason that the Dalai Lama has been so embracing of scientific inquiry and why Buddhism and scientific inquiry seem to be um, so much, perhaps better aligned than the Abrahamic faiths have, or at least Christianity has struggled more, I think, fundamentalist Christianity in particular, because because of the perspective that you describe. You know, when we were putting together the Interspiritual Day of Seeds of Compassion, we it was actually started out being called Interfaith Day, and someone pushed back about it being called Interfaith because they said, the Dharmic traditions are not based on faith. They're not based on belief. It's about practice or praxis, and it's and it's a kind of spirituality that that kind of the notion that spirituality is centered in faith is a very Western tradition, and that was I think an aha for a lot of people who are involved. Um, but you know the the scientific method has been called what we know about how not to fool ourselves, and the Dalai Lama has said clearly, you know, he's been asked, what, what happens when Buddhism, when, when science finds something that is contrary to what Buddhism teaches? And he says, well, we just, we need to change what Buddhism teaches. So there is this sense of openness and inquiry that I think is wonderful and that has really allowed the people who are following that tradition to move forward as human knowledge moves forward. Now, I would say that folk Buddhism is, you know, on the streets of many places that I've been at least, is really polytheism. I, I mean, in that, in that there, it, folk, folk Buddhism, you see a, a kind of a lot of people who are really, it's, oh, there's a kind of animism that gets baked, you know, woven in and things like that. But at the highest levels, it really is about the kind of non-theistic inquiry that, and openness that you're talking about. And, and I don't see, uh, these are mostly questions of mine. Actually, in a few weeks, we're going to have a, um, a session on Buddhism here, Buddhist boot camp. It's somewhere in the in the common good. And one of my questions is, I don't see much of a difference to address your question because, uh, for example, but again, these are questions of mine. I'm not steeped in the Buddhist tradition, but I don't think that they get away from the fundamental issues of authority either. Um, I notice that uh, when I was in Ballard, just a few blocks away, there was a, a, a Buddhist community, and I noticed they all dressed alike, and they all shaved their heads, and they looked pretty conformist to me. And so I, I, I always ask myself the question, um, is, is, you know, I'm so American, um, you know, is that the life I want to live? To hang around people, you know, shave their heads and, and wear these purple or maroon, uh, they all wear the same uniform, and they all shave their heads. and. Um, and I'm, I'm being a little crass here, but what I'm trying to get at is that I believe that when you're inside of any tradition, you're still going to have the same issues of the individual versus conforming to a rule. And that rule eventually has to have someone who is um, uh, the gatekeeper of that rule. And I don't think Buddhism gets away from that any more than Christianity. Um, so, I, the, the question, I think, um, is, well, it's kind of like the question of communism and capitalism. Both of them have in their idealistic uh, idealism, they're both systems that can work for a common good. But how it plays out in an individual's life, I think, is always a crapshoot. And Buddhists kill Buddhists, too. And so, I mean, they, it's, it's not a pure state. And so, I think they would have the same uh, struggles uh, as a theistic faith, uh, when the actual practice of it. Keith and, and I don't know your name, Joanne, Keith. I think that, I think of consciousness as something that is an emergent property of the physical world. That sometimes um, the whole really is greater than the sum of the parts. And that I, I, I guess I'd leave it there because I, beyond that, I don't know what the answer is. 
Mm-hmm. Not, I'm not sure that that's what, is that what you said? What was the, there was a phrase that you just used that I thought was great. It was, um, it was something like, you didn't say God, but... A, a consciousness? Consciousness is... I said consciousness, I, th I think that consciousness is an emergent property of the physical yes. world. Yes, consciousness is, a, is an emergent property of the physical world. And so I would say, perhaps, that God is an um, um, emergent, yeah, I'm going to get this, I promise, is an emergent property of the physical world. That's not the same thing as saying that God is physical. I'm not sure that there's a difference for me between transcendence and emergence. That, that is, there is, you know, essentially what, what we're talking about here is, is the way that change takes place. And it's the way that, that reality is, is constructed. And um, there's a woman named uh, Meg Wheatley who's written extensively about the process of, of social change and the or the mechanism of social change. And she talks about how there are essentially three stages in the in the development of in in emergent change or in how change takes place and the first is that um, there are communities of practice who who live in a certain way act in a certain way according to a a, devel a developing system of beliefs or expectations or assumptions and then begin to change where they are and who they are and then secondly, in a second stage, those communities of practice connect up with other communities of practice in networks. And then when the number of connections between all the nodes in the network are extensive and intensive enough and take place on, on enough level, levels, then suddenly emergent change takes place, which means that something utterly unexpected that's never existed before um, suddenly is there. An example in our lifetime is the civil rights movement in the South. How for, for generations there was a process of, of sub-Rosa change taking place um, before Rosa Parks one day stood or sat down on a, on a seat on a bus and wouldn't get up. It, what we don't know is the story that went, that, that went on before Rosa sat down. And it's that, that she was a civil rights organizer and worker and a, con a self-conscious change maker, part of a network of many other change makers um, all through the South in both black and white communities. And her act crystallized a moment of change. And when I, when I think about God, I, I think that that's her act. And the change that it gave rise to is a pretty good description of what God is. In a, in a sense, God um, does not exist, actually, without there being human agents who take place in a process of emergent change. And God, therefore, means nothing if God is not literally incarnate in, in, in a sense that is potentially Christian in all of us. When, when uh, the Seeds of Compassion event took place a few years ago, um, I was at a prayer breakfast, and I, both of you may have been at the same prayer breakfast that I was at with the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu, and I was there um, that morning, walked into the room, sat down. When they, when they said, all right, everybody find a seat and sat down, I just sat down in the nearest chair and th only then realized a few minutes later that I had sat down in the chair that was six inches away from Desmond Tutu. He was on the platform about this high, and I was at a table right there and he gave the opening prayer. And Desmond Tutu said, I would like to reflect on the following extraordinary contradiction, that we have an all-powerful God, the God that gave rise to and created the entire universe, and yet also a God who is absolutely and completely weak and inca incapacitated to do anything at all in the world. So this weak God, this, this exponentially weak God, this absolutely weak God can only act through the agency of human beings who love God and love their neighbors as themselves. And a couple of years ago, I read a book that I, I loved the title of. Um, 
that I was reminded of by this last question. The title of the book was, I could not be a Buddhist, or I could not, without, if I were not a Buddhist, I could not be a Christian. And that's the kind of God that I think I could believe in. <laughs> I, to answer your question, I, I think that the only possible solution to that is to deconstruct the Bible. If I could, I would unwind that decision was, that was made to canonize a specific set of texts, to elevate them above all of the other human musings, our struggles to understand what is good, what is real, and as I said earlier, how to live in moral community with each other. Because, I, I, because that package contains horrendous atrocities. It contains justifications for genocide. It sanctions things that are far worse than what Barack Obama is doing at a, at a, at a mythic level, at the level of, of legal code, at the level of storytelling, at all levels. And it also contains some of our highest aspirations and yearnings and models for what it means to be truly loving, truly compassionate. Um, and and as long as we have the package, as long as we can put that with a silver cover on it and put it on a pedestal, there will always be people who, in, who, who, who make an idol out of the whole thing. And, and, I, I, that, and I think that's an a hum, enormous problem. And, and the fact that what we see is kind of, and, and there are, there's the, the, the power of fundamentalism right here in the university districts, um, I think, is a testimony to the appeal of, of that kind of thinking. And that ultimately, w I, think some, I think somehow, collectively, universally, we need to call it what it is, which is idol worship. It's 9 o'clock. I know that some of you have some more questions, but Andrew and Valerie are going to be around for a little bit more. Um, there's some books, and you can look at them, peruse them. Um, actually, Jim's got some CDs as well, if you want to peruse those. Um, and he's also here, so you can just talk to the man himself. But uh, I wanted to close at 9, and those of you with questions, just come on up and, and chat. And wanted to thank you for being here next week uh, at 7 o'clock. Um, it's a... Um, uh, we, we move into the realm of the political and talking about a lot of the, uh, the, the trade um, uh, pacts that we have entered into with other nations. But I thought wanted to end by just expressing some thanks to Valerie and Andrew for a fascinating conversation tonight.